So I did a video previously on how to pass OSCE exams and I thought maybe let me do one on how to pass MCQ multiple choice question or single best answer question exams. I know a lot of you are having or some of you are having licensure exams and you're probably watching this video and we're praying maybe please do a video on this particular aspect. So lo and behold, your prayers have been answered. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. This is a season on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at passing multiple choice question exams, especially at medical school and especially doing licensure exams. Most of the world is now going towards single best answer because they are much easier to mark and it's much easier to test students over a variety of topics and a lot of details can actually be tested on these exams. But often people make a lot of mistakes, especially when they are undertaking these multiple choice exams and they tend to not do so well at them. So here are some tips that I put together to help you with acing your multiple choice question exams. So a disclaimer, remember that again, this is not a substitute for actual study. You can't pass exams by just winging it or faking it through. It's not possible. In high school, maybe you can by attending a few classes, same thing in pre-med, but in medical school and even for the licensure exams, you can't fluke your way through the exam. So this is just going to be a guide and it's not going to be a replacement for actual studying. And like I always say, the mouth cannot say what the brain doesn't know. You're not going to answer a question that you have no idea over. Of course, you can guess there's a 25% chance. If you have four options, A, B, C, D, there's a 25% chance that you may guess the correct answer, but there's again a 75% chance that you're going to guess the wrong answer if you're guessing. So remember that the MCQs are going to be testing a wide variety of information and it's not possible for you to revise every single thing which is why we'll give you the strategies that will help you maximize the little marks that you have and the little information that you may have in order for you to pass your exams. So here's a question. And I know some of you actually have been using these techniques. I have been using these techniques. I actually learned it from my sister. So which of the following is the most effective strategy for multiple choice tests used by students? A, when in doubt, the answer is C. This is one that my sister always told me when, when I was going to write my exam. She was always like, whenever you're doubting, just thought that the answer most likely is C. Because for some reason, psychologically, people like to put C as the correct answer for some reason. So most exams will have a lot of Cs if you actually think about it. But that's one option. B, the longest answer is the correct answer. You're only screwed when pretty much every single option has equal lengths of the answer. That's another thing that people think about. Some people go for any, mini, mini, mo, or they just close their eyes and say, God, wherever my finger lands, that's probably going to be the answer. And then your finger ends up landing on the question instead of the answer. Then you have to do it again. Or some people say, I'm always going to pick all of the above. Some people say, I'm always going to pick none of the above or they use another strategy. So these are just some of the things that people have been using in high school, in pre-med, that some may have even been using the strategies in medical school and they may have been working, they may not have been working, but these strategies are not going to be effective when you come to use them in university. They're not going to be effective in medical school. They're not going to be effective when you're taking board exams or licensure exams. So what's going to be effective is you studying and you should study the right material. It's one thing to study and not understand. Make sure that whatever you're studying, you're grasping the information and you're understanding. You should be able to practice problems. Solve past exams because it will help you give an idea of what the examiner was thinking, what the examiner looks for, the things that are often commonly tested on. Sometimes you may be lucky that they may repeat certain elements of that paper that you're revising, or sometimes you may be lucky they may re repeat certain concepts. They may not repeat the exact same question, but what they are trying to see is if you have grasped the principle. And of course, attending class, if you have extra lessons, if you are attending uh, university, make sure that you attend all the classes because that's the best way to get the information. 
So I'm going to present to you five strategies that are going to be helping you in terms of passing the multiple choice exams. So stay tuned for each of these particular tips. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel at this particular moment, we're on the road to 14,000 subscribers. This is quite mental because just a few years ago, we're talking about reaching 2,000 subscribers, but now we're on the road to 14,000 subscribers. Please tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe so that by the end of the day, we actually reach 14,000 subscribers. Hit the like button, drop a comment to show some support. So beginning with tip number one, which is of course underrated, but very important. Make sure that you read the question carefully. So you should understand what the question is asking of you. Most of the times people get things wrong because they ignore certain aspects of the question and they ignore certain phrases or certain words that are in the question. For example, if they say the following are true concerning preeclampsia, except, so meaning that if you just read the following are true concerning preeclampsia and you ignore the except part, then you're going to end up choosing the first option that you see that is true for preeclampsia, but you have answered the question wrongly. If it was a question that was saying the following are true for preeclampsia, then you would have gotten the question correct. But because you have ignored those things, such as the not or always that are pretty much in included in the question, it will mean that the whole sense of the question has changed. So whenever you're reading your question, make sure to underline those things like not always so that you can actually keep them in the back of your mind that this is asking me for what is not true. Another strategy that I tend to use is that I tend to flip the question around and ask myself, what exactly is this question asking me? For example, the same question that I gave you, the following are true concerning preeclampsia, except, so I'll just simply say to myself, what are they asking me here? They're just asking me which of the following is not true about preeclampsia or which of the following is false regarding preeclampsia. That way, when I paraphrase the question, I'm able to understand what exactly the examiner is looking for and I'm able to pinpoint on the options. So if you don't understand the question, um, then you can skip it. You can come back to it later. Of course, remember that some other questions in that particular exam may open your mind because the way the mind works or the way memory works, it works with association. So they may ask you a question about preeclampsia on question one and you're lost. Then you get to question five and they ask you something that is related to question one. And then it opens your mind and helps you remember the point on question one. So don't spend too much time on one particular question where you're stuck. Moreover, if you spend too much time on that particular question, you become anxious that you're not able to answer this. And then once you're anxious that you're not able to answer this, then it disturbs your whole memory, disturbs the whole process. So you can actually skip that question and come back later. It's not always that you have to start on question one, unless if it's like one of those online things where you're ticking and it's progressing for you in order, then if that's the case, then you, are, you have no choice. But if it's like a written test, there's no need for you to start on question one. If you want, you can start from the back, you can start in the middle, you can start from anywhere. Now, the key thing about these is you make sure that you don't mess up your answering order. Once you do this, you must make sure that you counter check your work twice, at least so that you make sure that you don't mess up the answering order. Because once you mess up the answering order, it means that all your answers are affected and you end up failing that exam. That's the biggest drawback of you not starting from question one or you not answering them in order. So make sure that you counter check your work twice if you skipped any questions to make sure that the answers that you're putting, especially if they are on a separate answer sheet, are going to be telling with your questions. And moving on to step two, you should answer the question without looking at the option. So often, if they give you a stem of the question, for example, a clinical scenario, the first thing that you must always ask or have in your mind is that what is the diagnosis that they're looking for? Then after you've now answered that question of what is the diagnosis that I'm looking for, then you can answer what is the answer of this question, minus you actually even reading through the options to begin with. Because by virtue of you coming up with this, then you have an idea in your mind that once you now go into the options, you're able to identify which one is the correct option. And you can actually even compare your answer to the options. This only becomes a bit of a problem if already they've given you what you're thinking in the question and then they ask you something extra in the options. In this case, that's when you have to use the other tips that I'm going to mention to you that can help you now identify the answer when they have already told you the answer in the stem of the question. So you should be able to look for the options that have similar ideas to what you had in mind and the key terms to what you had uh, been thinking about what the answer is to this particular stem of the question before actually coming to the options. Then 
if now they have given you the that particular thing that you were thinking about in the questions and they've asked you something else that you weren't really even expecting because we often do get examiners saying that you're going to want to eliminate the incorrect options so you should read each option and make sure that you eliminate the ones that are outrightly wrong eliminate them completely for example let's say which of the following is true regarding preeclampsia and then one of the options that's there they say that it is seen after menopause you already know that preeclampsia is a disease that's affecting pregnancy. It's not possible for someone to be pregnant once they have reached menopause. So you can completely cancel that option off. If you have a pencil, you can actually cancel it off so that your mind isn't entertaining that option and you have completely ruled it out such so you're left with three options that are remaining. Then once you have eliminated this option, then you can now start thinking of the other things. Then they may not be related to the question or they may be completely off. So cancel those ones that are not related to the question. Cancel those that are completely off. Then the things that you're remaining with, if you're remaining with two options, for example, then think of the answer that you had at the beginning and try and eliminate one of the options so that you remain with the best answer. Most of the times, what I like to say is that the answer that has the most similarity to your diagnosis or to the answer that you had at the beginning is most likely the answer or the one that has the least similarity to the other options is the one that is most likely the answer so it's okay sometimes to restart the question if you think you do not have the correct answer you can restart the question but most of the times i've seen that when the first answer that often comes to most students minds is often the one that's the answer because sometimes if you spend way too much time on a particular question you tend to overthink things then you tend to cancel the correct answer and putting something that is wrong remember that the examiner is not trying to punish you they're not trying to fail you all they're trying to do is test your knowledge to see if you know your stuff so sometimes self-doubt is what tends to kill a lot of people especially on the multiple choice questions Moving on to tip number four, make sure that you answer all the questions. This one is a given. So leave no stone unturned. Even if you don't know the answer, make an educated guess. Try and think, try and use other principles that you learned in other topics to answer a particular question, such that if you use those principles, you may not know what you're thinking may be correct. Of course, this does not always work, but it may help you because if you try, and you make an educated guess and you get it correct, no one's going to know. Even when you're marking your paper, they're not going to know that you guessed that particular question. But if you don't try, rest assured, if you leave it blank, you're guaranteed to get zero on that particular question. Then the last and the final tip is, of course, the most important thing. Manage your time wisely. So you want to budget the time that you have to answer each of the questions. And you should have enough time to review your questions and you should have enough time to transfer them to your answer sheet if you are not answering on your answer sheet to begin with. So before you actually start the test, ask yourself, how many questions do I have in this test? How much time do I have in this test? Then you should allocate ample time for you to answer those questions, ample time for you to revise through your answers and make any corrections. If there is need for any significant corrections, you should have enough time to counter check your work. So for example, if you have 200 questions that you have to answer in a three hour test, you can actually budget and say in two and a half hours, I'm going to complete this test. That means that roughly I will be spending like one minute per question. Of course, there are those questions which are very short that you even spend less than a minute. Then after you, you've done this, excuse me, after you've done this, you're going to be remaining with about 30 minutes. That 30 minutes that is there is you make sure that you counter check your work to see that the answers that you have put are the ones that are telling on your answer sheet, number one. To make sure that you haven't skipped any particular question, you haven't left anything unanswered, and once you've counter-checked your work, then you can hand in your work. Now, for the terms, in terms of the counter-checking, usually I like to tell my students that counter-check your work at least twice. The first time that you're counter-checking your work is you're counter-checking your work to see if the answers that you have on the questions tally what you have on your answer sheet such that you haven't misplaced a certain answer or haven't put something else where it's not supposed to be that's the first time very quick to do this very quick to just counter check your work to see you haven't messed up the order of your questions that's the first time then the second time you're counter checking your work and now counter checking those questions where you are not so sure about the answer and kind of thinking them through because sometimes now that you've gone through the whole paper some concepts may have been 
become much more clearer to you and you may sometimes change your opinion on certain answers. This is the time where you can actually change your answers or you can leave them as they are. The most dangerous part of counter checking your work is because sometimes you may erase the correct answer and leave the wrong answer or you may sometimes erase the wrong answer and leave the correct answer. We hope that for your exam you do erase the wrong answer and leave the correct answer rather than the first scenario. So once you go through your second your work again for the second time, you're cross-checking through those questions that gave you a bit of a hustle and make sure that, okay, if you're satisfied with that particular answer, you leave it as is. If you think that we could still entertain another option, you can entertain another option and have a different point of view of how you're going to be looking at this particular question. Whenever you're answering your MCQ questions, the ones that are difficult, you can put an asterisk on them so that you can come back and you know that, oh, these questions that I've put an asterisk in pencil, I know that these are the ones that gave me a hard time, so you just go straight to them so that you don't waste time going again from one up to, for example, 200, looking for the questions that gave you difficulty. Because as you're answering, you already put asterisks on them, knowing that you'll come back to them to counter check when you're counter checking your paper for the second time. Now, some general advice as you're preparing for your MCQ exams, remember that you want to prepare smart, know your strengths and your weaknesses. For example, if you're taking a licensure exam, it's going to be composed of multiple courses. You have to get at least 50% in the whole paper for you to pass that particular exam. So you know that if you're very strong at internal medicine, in those sections of internal medicine, please make sure that you maximize as many marks as possible in internal medicine. If you know that you're not so strong in pediatrics, if it's in the preparatory phase, make sure that you prepare adequately for pediatrics so that you're going to try your best to at least aim to get more than half of those questions correct. Once you do this, you maximize your strengths in a particular course and you improve on your weaknesses, you find out that your overall mark will actually improve. If you are meant to get a 45, you end up getting a 65. And once you get a 65%, you've cleared the exam. Make sure that you cover all the essential topics. There's a list of high yield topics that are tested on each and every single exam. So make sure you know those essential topics and you cover them. When you're taking the exam, be calm be composed, do not panic. Once you panic, all your information goes away. If you can't answer the first 10 questions, don't panic. Take three deep breaths, move on and say, maybe let me go to the back of the test. If you go to the back of the test, you can't answer those, take a deep breath again, go to the middle. If you're at the middle and you can't answer that, then maybe you're screwed. I'm just joking. Still take a deep breath. You may still have some questions that you may answer. So be calm, be composed and do not panic. The night before is very important, especially for MCQ exams because MCQ exams require you to be fresh, they require you to think clearly. So make sure that you get enough rest the night before. If it's studying in advance, make sure that you study in advance and you get enough rest. During the exam, make sure that you hydrate yourself, make sure that you carry some sweets because thinking can sometimes deplete your blood glucose. So if they do allow sweets in your exams, make sure you carry some sweets so that you can maintain your blood glucose, you have optimal thinking so that you don't come out of that exam having a headache or worst case scenario you don't faint during the process of that exam. I really hope you enjoyed this video on how to pass MCQ questions. If you did consider subscribing to the channel on our road to 14,000 subscribers, tell a friend to tell a friend, hit the like button, drop a comment to show some support to Zambia and beyond. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.